This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Chapter 22 In which Passepartout finds out that even at the antipodes it is convenient to have some money in one's pocket. The Carnatic setting sail from Hong Kong at half past six on the 7th of November directed her course at full steam towards Japan. She carried a large cargo and a well-filled cabin of passengers. Two staterooms in the rear were, however, unoccupied, those which had been engaged by Phileas Fogg. The next day a passenger with a half-stupefied eye, staggering gait, and disordered hair was seen to emerge from the second cabin and to totter to a seat on deck. It was Passepartout, and what had happened to him was as follows. Shortly after Fix left the opium den, two waiters had lifted the unconscious Passepartout and had carried him to the bed, reserved for the smokers. Three hours later, pursued even in his dreams by a fixed idea, the poor fellow awoke and struggled against the stupefying influence of the narcotic. The thought of a duty unfulfilled shook off his torpor, and he hurried from the abode of drunkenness, staggering and holding himself up by keeping against the walls, falling down and creeping up again, and irresistibly impelled by a kind of instinct, he kept crying out, The Carnatic! The Carnatic! The steamer lay puffing alongside the quay, on the point of starting. His part two had but few steps to go, and rushing upon the plank, he crossed it, and fell unconscious on the deck, just as the Carnatic was moving off. Several sailors, who were evidently accustomed to this sort of scene, carried the poor Frenchman down into the second cabin, and Pispartu did not wake until they were one hundred and fifty miles away from China. Thus he found himself the next morning on the deck of the Carnatic, and eagerly inhaling the exhilarating sea breeze. The pure air sobered him. He began to collect his sense, which he found a difficult task. But at last he recalled the events of the evening before, Fix's revelation and the opium house. It is evident, said he to himself, that I have been abominably drunk. What will Mr. Fogg say? At least I have not missed the steamer, which is the most important thing. Then, as Fix occurred to him, as for that rascal, I hope we are well rid of him and that he has not dared, as he proposed, to follow us on board the Carnatic. A detective on the track of Mr. Fogg accused of robbing the Bank of England? Fwah! Mr. Fogg is no more a robber than I am a murderer. Should he divulge Fix's real errand to his master? No. Would it do to tell the part the detective was playing? Would it not be better to wait until Mr. Fogg reached London again, and then import to him that an agent of the Metropolitan Police had been following him round the world and have a good laugh over it? No doubt, at least, it was worth considering. The first thing to do was to find Mr. Fogg and apologize for his singular behavior. His part two got up and proceeded as well as he could with the ruling of the steamer to the after deck. He saw no one who resembled either his master or Aoda. Good, muttered he. Aoda has not got up yet, and Mr. Fogg has probably found some partners at whist. He descended to the saloon. Mr. Fogg was not there. His part two had only, however, to ask the pursuer the number of his master's stateroom. The pursuer replied that he did not know any passenger by the name of Fogg. I beg your pardon? said Pispartu, persistently, 
he is a tall gentleman quiet and not very talkative and has with him a young lady there is no lady on board interrupted the pursuer here is a list of the passengers you may see for yourself his part to scan the list but his master's name was not upon it all at once an idea struck him ah am i on the carnatic yes on the way to yokohama certainly his part to had for an instant feared that he was on the wrong boat but though he was really on the carnatic his master was not there he felt thunderstruck on a seat he saw it all now he remembered that the time of selling had been changed that he should have informed his master of that fact and that he had not done so it was his fault then that mr fogg and Iota had missed the steamer yes but it was still more the fault of the traitor who in order to separate him from his master and detain the latter at hong kong had indulged him into getting drunk he now saw the detective's trick and at this moment mr fogg was certainly ruined his bet was lost and he himself perhaps arrested and imprisoned at this thought his part to tore his hair ah if fix ever came within his reach what a settling of accounts there would be after his first depression his part to became calmer and began to study his situation it was certainly not an enviable one he found himself on the way to japan and what should he do when he got there his pocket was empty he had not a solitary shilling not so much as a penny his passage had fortunately been paid for in advance and he had five or six days in which to decide upon his future course he fell to at mills with an appetite and ate for mr fogg aoda and himself he helped himself as generously as if japan were a desert where nothing to eat was to be looked for at dawn on the thirteenth the carnatic entered the port of yokohama this is an important port of call in the pacific where all the mail steamers and those carrying travelers between north america china japan and the oriental islands put in it is situated in the bay of yedo and at but a short distance from that second capital of the japanese empire and the residence of the tycoon the civil emperor before the mikado the spiritual emperor absorbed his office in his own the carnatic anchored at the quay near the custom house in the midst of a crowd of ships bearing the flags of all nations was part two went timidly ashore on this so curious territory of the sons of the sun he had nothing better to do than taking chance for his guide to wander aimlessly through the streets of yokohama he found himself at first in a thoroughly european quarter the houses having low fronts and being adorned with verandas beneath which he caught glimpses of neat peristyles this quarter occupied with its streets squares docks and warehouses all the space between the promontory of the treaty and the river here as at hong kong and calcutta were mixed crowds of all races americans and english chinese and dutchmen mostly merchants ready to buy or sell anything the frenchman felt himself as much alone among them as if he had dropped down in the midst of potentates he had at least one resource to call on the french and english councils at yokohama for assistance but he shrank from telling the story of his adventures intimately connected as it was with that of his master and before doing so he determined to exhaust all other means of aid as chance did not favor him in the european quarter he penetrated that inhabited by the native japanese determined if necessary to push on to yedo 
The Japanese quarter of Yokohama is called Benten, after the goddess of the sea, who was worshipped on the islands round about. There Pasparto beheld beautiful fir and cedar groves, sacred gates of a singular architecture, bridges half hid in the midst of bamboos and reeds, temples shaded by immense cedar trees, holy retreats where were sheltered Buddhist priests, and interminable streets where a perfect harvest of rose-tinted and red-cheeked children, who looked as if they had been cut out of Japanese screens, and who were playing in the midst of short-legged poodles, and yellowish cats might have been gathered. The streets were crowded with people. Priests were passing in processions, beating their dreary tambourines. Police and custom house officers with pointed hats and crusted with lack and carrying two sabres hung to their waist. Soldiers clad in blue cotton with white stripes and bearing guns, the Mikado guards enveloped in silken doubles, hauberks, and coats of mail, and numbers of military folk of all ranks for the military profession is as much respected in Japan as it is despised in China, went hither and thither in groups and pairs. Pasparto saw two begging frades, long-robbed pilgrims, and simple civilians, who their warped and jet-black hair, big heads, long busts, slender legs, short stature and complexions varying from copper color to a dead white but never yellow like the chinese from whom the japanese widely differ he did not fail to observe the curious equipages carriages and palaquins barrows supplied with cells and litters made of bamboo nor the woman whom he thought not especially handsome, who took little steps with their little feet, whereupon they were canvas shoes, straw sandals, and clogs of worked wood, and who displayed tight-looking eyes, flat chests, teeth fashionably blackened, and gowns crossed with silken scarfs tied in an enormous knot behind an ornament which the modern Parisian ladies seem to have borrowed from the dams of Japan. Pusparto wandered for several hours in the midst of this motley crowd, looking in at the windows of the rich and curious shops, the jewelry establishments glittering with want Japanese ornaments, the restaurants decked with streamers and banners, the tea houses where the odorous beverage was being drunk with sake, a liquor concocted from the fermentation of rice, and the comfortable smoking houses, where they were puffing, not opium, which is almost unknown in Japan, but a very fine, stringy tobacco. He went on till he found himself in the fields, in the midst of vast rice plantations. There he saw dazzling camelies expanding themselves with flowers, which were giving forth their last colors and perfumes, not on bushes, but on trees, and within bamboo enclosures, cherry, plum, and apple trees, which the Japanese cultivate rather for their blossoms than their fruits, and which queerly fashioned, grinning scarecrows, protected from the sparrows, pigeons, ravens, and other various birds. On the branches of the cedars were perched large eagles amid the foliage of the weeping willows, 
were herons, solemnly standing on one leg, and on every hand were crows, ducks, hawks, wild birds, and a multitude of cranes, which the Japanese consider sacred, and which to their minds symbolize long lives and prosperity. As he was strolling along, Prospartu espied some violets among the shrubs. Good, said he, I'll have some supper. But on smelling them, he found that they were adorless. No chance there, thought he. The worthy fellow had certainly taken good care to eat as heartily a breakfast as possible before leaving the carnatic. But, as he had been walking about all day, the demands of hunger were becoming importunate. He observed that the butcher stalls contained neither mutton, goat, nor pork. And knowing also that it is a sacrilege to kill cattle, which are preserved solely for farming, he made up his mind that meat was far from plentiful in Yokohama. Nor was he mistaken, and in default of butcher's meat, he could have wished for a quarter of wild boar or deer, a partridge or some quails, some game of fish which with rice the Japanese eat almost exclusively. But he found it necessary to keep up a stout heart and to postpone the meal he craved till the following morning. Night came, and Pospartu re-entered the native quarter, where he wandered through the streets, lit by very colored lanterns, looking on at the dancers, who were executing skillful steps, and boundings, and the astrologers, who stood in the open air with their telescopes. Then he came to the harbor, which was lit up by the raisin torches of the fishermen who were fishing from their boats the streets at last became quiet and then patrol the officers of which in their splendid customs and surrounded by their sooties Pispartu thought seemed like ambassadors succeeded the bustling crowd each time a company passed Pispartu chuckled and said to himself Good, another Japanese embassy departing for Europe. End of chapter 22. This has been a TVOL3 production.